Thank you, Owen. Very interesting. Uh, next up, can we please welcome Mike Robinson, Managing Director and Engineering Manager of Engistics, who will talk to you about what causes rollovers. Thanks very much. When um, Matt rang me and asked me to come along and talk about truck rollovers, I went, great, I've got to pack about that to really put it all in perspective for you. It takes about an hour, Matt, and he said, you've got 15 minutes. So what you're about to hear is basically the miniskirt version. Okay, it's uh, short enough to be interesting um, and just long enough to cover the bare essentials. So, what causes truck rollover? Look, I didn't think I'd put a, uh, a stock truck or a rural one up there. I thought I'd uh, be on neutral ground. But this accident that I had to investigate a couple of years ago now was a really interesting one. Because the company concerned, and you can see it I'm sure, rang me up and said, look, I don't get it. We've downloaded the GPS data for this truck and the same driver has driven that same truck carrying that same load within, you know, honestly within about 20 kilos, on that same corner and that same route 57 times before. And on this 58th trip, he's totaled the truck big time. And luckily he didn't total himself, but didn't do good things for himself either. What the hell was the difference? We're going to explore that and come back to that at the end. Right, what causes it? How do trucks roll over? Look, most people, I think, know that really your essentials are that your centre of gravity of the prime mover is low, your centre of gravity of a loaded truck is high, so they tend to go from the back. Surprise, surprise. And we don't always have a good understanding of that. Um, but typically the back twists and then you get a flick at the front. And that flick is very dangerous for drivers not wearing your seatbelt because it's a very sharp G-force. Stock crates are probably a little different to that because they've got much more torsional resistance um, than a, uh, a normal uh, I-beams in a semi-trailer. So they tend to look more stable and they'll stay there, stay there and then go bang in one go. Okay. Let's have a little look at what a, um, how a truck rolls over. And so this is the video that um, you've, if you've used, seen the Vic Roads truck rollover pack, uh, we actually helped contribute to it in a very small way to that. Um, and this is video is from the USA where they were doing some load restraint tests on some aluminium coils and they drove a truck progressively around a certain radius at an increasing speed. I've seen the video of two miles an hour less than this speed and absolutely nothing happened. It was just boring. They told the driver, OK, now drive around two more, kilometer, two more miles, now three kilometres, now faster. And this is what happened at Maestro, if you could... Well, the load restraint worked well. Didn't give enough thought to the rollover stuff. It's American truck, obviously, and it's quite a few years ago that happened now. But there's a couple of really interesting points here if we start analysing what's going on. Okay, have a look at the photo. Guess what? There are no brake lights. Guess what? That's the critical point of no return for that particular truck and load. The centre of gravity gets to the outside edge of the tyres and it doesn't matter what the hell the driver does, it's all over Red Rover, that truck is now going to roll. It has to. The laws of physics say it has to. At that point in time, what's the driver feeling? Okay. Well, guess what? Look at the prime mover. The wheels of the prime mover are still touching the ground. The freight's twisting up, but the prime mover's not. So the feedback loop to the driver is not happening yet. There's this disconnect. Okay, Now, even a, what we call a, a hyper-vigilant truck driver, that is, I'm sitting there waiting for this accident to happen because I'm in a test, Okay, it typically takes around about one second for that person to identify the problem. Oh, hell, what am I going to do about it? Let's brake, get his foot on the pedal, and then it takes about another 0.3 of a second odd to get that into applying the, uh, the discs or drums to their, uh, to their linings to the, to the disc or drum. So you don't get any retardation for at least 1.3 seconds for a hypervigilant driver, and for most of it, it's more like one and a half, anything up to 1.8. And the older you get, the slower your reactions get. Interesting comment about age of truck drivers there. So that's 
what happened. That's the critical point of no return. Yep, if we go on a little bit more, that is 1.0 seconds. That's the frame out of the video, which is 1.0 seconds from the time the truck lifted off the ground, the rear wheel lifted off the ground. Anybody think we can recover that truck? What did I just say about typical reaction times, about, you know, between ballpark number, one and a half seconds? And guess what? That's the first frame in the video where you can just see the little red lights in the circle where the truck driver, who is in a test, so he knows he's being, you know, videoed and all the rest of it. He's super alert, relatively speaking, compared to dawdling down the highway. And that's the first frame in the video where the brake lights have come on on the truck. Drivers tell me, oh, no, if I feel it's starting to go, well, I'll just counteract it and correct it. Rubbish. It all happens so quickly, driver, you can't catch it. Yeah, there's going to be exceptions where it might just teeter on the edge, but that's pretty unusual in my experience. Okay. I remember doing two accident investigations of two B-doubles from the same company happened two weeks apart. When the second one happened, I decided they better do something about checking it. First driver said to me, I have no idea what the hell happened. He said, honestly, I thought I was driving around the road. Next minute, you know, there's gravel coming in the passenger window. Yep, he's had a micro-sleep, he's drifted off and he's reefed it when he's woken up. And it goes so quickly that he just, what the hell happened? The other driver gave me the full bull story. Oh, yeah, well, I felt this and I tried to do this and then that didn't work. I tried to do the other. It's like rubbish. You hit the roundabout way too fast because I could work backwards from the skid length to tell you exactly how fast he was doing. And it was like 20 kilometres an hour over a sensible speed for that roundabout. Way too fast. Nothing he could have done would have saved the day in that circumstance. Okay? So if that's one second like later, that's what two seconds looks like, like two seconds after the first point of liftoff. So your basic conclusion here, folks, is we've got to stop this happening before it gets started because the driver can't stop it. It's not something that a physical human being can react fast enough to detect and pick up and counteract by starting to, to slow the vehicle or steer the vehicle, um, you know, out of a problem. So that's dot point one. Second issue I'd like to talk about, okay, I get told there are thousands of reasons why trucks roll over and I get all sorts of lovely stories and, you know, oh, it's inexperienced by the driver. Actually, when I start as an engineer to figure out, well, why did this truck roll over, it's really simple. There's only one reason trucks roll over, from as an engineering point of view. It's when the overturning moment is bigger than the writing moment. And then I work backwards from there to figure out why are those things wrong. Now, the overturning moment, trying to drive the truck over, is pretty simple. It's the centrifugal force multiplied by the height of the centre of gravity, and that's the force trying to roll it over. And the writing force is basically its own weight by half of its width, and that's trying to hold it down on the ground. Okay, Now, that centrifugal force is calculated by getting the speed, squaring it, so speed multiplied by itself, divided by the radius of turning at the time. That gives you, and if you do it in metres per second, not kilometres an hour in metres, the radius, that gives you the g-force. Multiply that by the, by the height of the centre of gravity, and away you go. Our problem here is we don't intrinsically, human beings basically understand speed as a linear thing. But it's not. In this equation, it's speed squared. Let's have a look at that. So I want to just give you... Imagine we've got a corner, and this is a corner we've all decided, the numbers and, and our feel for it, this is a 60 kilometre an hour corner. That's, that's the sensible speed through this corner. OK? Now, would anybody in this room sack a truck driver if he went through that corner at 65 kilometres an hour and you've just ordered decided it was a 60k corner. I don't see a lot of hands, but, you know, somebody might. What about 70 kilometres an hour? Oh, look, you'd probably bloody have a good hard chat to the guy and say, no, mate, that's too bloody fast. What are you thinking? The problem is we don't really understand it because, look, in our cars, we all go five kilometres an hour through the corner, 10 kilometres an hour through the corner. I live in Sydney for my sins. Who doesn't drive 10 kilometres an hour over the speed limit in Sydney? Every bugger. Well, no, if you really want to understand rollover and put it in proper context, you've got to say, no, no, we're not looking at speed, 
we're looking at speed squared. So what you really should be saying is we're not comparing 60 to 65 to 70. No, no, we're actually comparing 60 squared, relatively speaking, to 65 squared to 70 squared. Well, hang on, that's a big difference. Because that little bit of speed to March, 65 kilometres now, that look, most people would go, no, nah, a couple of kilometres now, no big deal. Actually, that's a 17% increase in overturning force. And if you hit it at 70 instead of 60, that's a 36% too much overturning force, driver. Man, that's a big jump. That's a big jump. Now, let's look at the other factor that's involved because it's not just speed, it's speed divided by the radius of turning. And the radius of turning is not the radius of the road, it's the instantaneous radius that the driver takes. So you can, we all, you know, apex the corner and decrease the radius, or I'm not paying attention because I've had a micro sleep, or I'm just not paying attention because I'm on my mobile phone, or I'm just not paying attention because I'm fatigued, or any one of a thousand other reasons, and you tighten up too tightly, too quickly, what does that do? Well, let's look at exactly that same situation and say, look, the driver misjudges the corner. So he starts in at 60 or maybe 65 or maybe 70 if he's not quite on the money. What does that mean if I actually have to tighten up by just, say, 10% tighter on the radius? That's not a huge change. I've just misjudged the corner. You know, the sort of thing when, when you hit the corner a bit too fast and you go, oh, struth, I'm a bit fast for this corner, I don't have this road, and then you have to tighten it up midway through. Well, maybe you've hit it mm, really qu definitely a bit fast and you've got to tighten up quite a bit, maybe not just a 10% tightening, but maybe a 20% tightening. And in relative numbers, holy smokes. Because suddenly, if you happen to be going in there Let's say you're going in five kilometres an hour too fast, but you've got to tighten up a lot. You're at 46, almost 47% more overturning force. If you went in way too fast, but only had to tighten a little bit, 10% tightening, you're at 51% more overturning force. And if you manage to do both, and of course that's half the reason you have to tighten mid-corner, because you actually hit it a bit fast and didn't judge it well, you've suddenly increased your overturning force by 70%. That's a massive increase in overturning force. And the really bad news to put it into perspective for you is, mo look, there's a massive range of numbers here, but ballpark number, I reckon the average truck's probably got about 50% margin up his sleeve. So if you get more than 50% increase in the overturning force, you're probably in trouble. Unless we're talking empty trucks, if we're talking loader trucks. So suddenly, that tanker who went through the corner 57 times, what actually happened in that accident? Well, just as he was coming up to the corner, he got dawn straight in his eyes and he put the hand up, put the visor down and, of course, that just takes that extra little bit of a second. He's ended up further in the corner than he thought he was. He said, all I can remember is I got blinded by the early morning light and, you know, we did the sums and, yes, that was dawn straight ahead of him. Okay, he put the visor down. He said, and the next thing I know, there's gravel coming in the window. <laughs> Just, what the hell happened? Yeah, because it's about a second later, it's gone. Because he's got too far into the corner. Yes, he was probably that extra few kilometres an hour that day. And then he's got later into the corner to steer around it. And it's all over Red Rover, just like that. We don't, from our feel... We don't understand that extra couple of kilometres an hour is actually really serious. Okay? We tend to guess what corners look like and we're generally pretty rude good at it because we're experienced drivers. But the truth is you don't need to have very much extra speed on board to make a disproportionate problem. And that is especially bad if you have a, a swerve or tightening up of the, of the, the thing mid-corner. Mid Other factors... Now we're really skating over. Um, the height of centre of gravity is really crucial. We haven't got time to talk about it today, um, but we know that it's a really big problem and I can give you some benchmark numbers in another day. Okay, so if you know you've got a really high centre of gravity on the thing, honestly, you can roll the truck in a heartbeat if you just have a little sharp swerve if you're already at highway speed. Okay? You've got a high centre of gravity load, 
you need to have your drivers knowing, look, really back off by 10 kilometres an hour with, with, with an ordinary load. Um, if the load shifts as you're going through that corner S-bend or roundabout, that's going to be disastrous for the forces concerned. We haven't got time to go there. If the load sloshes like a half-full tanker, disastrous in terms of those forces. And in fact, this particular tanker that I was talking about earlier on, we looked at it and said, oh, the tank's full, so you wouldn't get any slosh factor. And about two days later, the penny dropped. Yeah, it's full, but it's a, the tanker was actually carrying a water treatment chemical, which is really a slurry. And what you've got to understand about a slurry is it's basically rocks in a fluid. So guess what? The rocks will still slosh inside the fluid. So you do get a dynamic slosh even when the tank is full. Another straw on the camel's back. Okay. And yes, poor road geometry comes into it. If you've got a nasty camber, reverse corner, roundabouts. I mean, roundabouts, I'm a civil engineer by original training. We, all, we drain almost all roundabouts to the outside. Because if we drain it to the inside, you get mud and leaves and slush, and before you know it, you're aquaplaning. And that's not good fun in a storm. So most roundabouts drain to the outside, so drive up, back off on roundabouts, because they're prone for rollovers, because of the reverse camber. Suspension type. Yes, we can talk about that for 10 minutes, but we haven't got time to do it today. Suffice to say that that does come into it, but it's a small effect. Suspension and tyres are the secondary effect as you get the lean into it. That's, yes, it counts, but it's not the main game. That's only a small thing on the side. Okay. So, how would I summarise things? I'd say, let's not kid ourselves that the drivers can actually make up for being human. If they have a human error and hit it too fast, if they have a human error and swerve or, or tighten the steering up unexpectedly for some reason, they're in real trouble and they cannot get themselves out of it. They can't react as human beings, we can't react quickly enough. Okay? The square of the speed goes up a hell of a lot faster than the speed does, but we don't, we're don't. we humans, we think linear, we don't think in squares. Okay? A sudden swerve is really dangerous. That's why um, you get an awful lot of road uh, rollovers when the driver's tired, because basically his attention span has gone to hell, even if it isn't a micro-sleep. And, and micro-sleep is just the classic rollover, because you go over, you start hitting up. I can remember talking to a driver, he said, look, I woke up because I could hear the sudden noise of me hitting the, um, the knocking over the white guideposts. And he said, I didn't even think about it. I just swerved to get back onto the road without even blinking. And he said, next minute, you know, the tanker rolled, the prime mover broke away, flipped over end over end, and the guy walked away bleeding, but he walked away. And you think, man, was that lucky. But when you did the mathematics and science on it, by the time the wheels were out knocking over the white guideposts on the fallover on the on the, uh, the Bruce Highway, there was no way he was ever going to save that. Because you don't even think about it. It's, it's an instinctive reaction when you get that sudden startle response, you try to get back on the road. I don't know anybody who's ever swerved off into the sugarcane field deliberately. It's not much, oh shit. Okay. If you have a high centre of gravity on your load, you're just making all of these effects much worse. We haven't got time to go through there today. Simple rule of thumb. What do I mean by high centre of gravity? If your centre of gravity for your payload to the ground is below 2.3 metres, you're probably OK, almost regardless of what tyres and suspension you've got and all the rest of it. If your centre of gravity is more than 2.6 metres above the ground, panic now, save time later, because your static roll threshold is rubbish, and therefore your margin for error is getting very small. It's really easy to roll a truck with a high centre of gravity. Okay? So what I'd really like to do is I'd like to wave my magic wand and invent some, I don't know, probably have to be computers because it has to be very, very fast, some magic system that could detect when the truck gets near to the point of rollover and intervene before the driver can. Gee whiz, somebody's done that. It's called electronic rollover protection, electronic stability control and 27 other acronyms. I don't sell it. But I think it's a bloody good idea. Bring it on.